you know, people say, well, what's the meaning of life? To walk with God so that you're in the ark when the flood comes. To the Sermon on the Mount, which I think is probably the key document in the New Testament. I think it's the closest thing we have to a fully articulated description of what it would mean to walk with God so that you're in the ark when the flood comes. It's the, it's the most fully articulated realization of that idea that if I say, well, you should conduct yourself like Noah and walk with God and build an ark, obviously those are poetic and metaphorical suggestions and sufficiently practical and personal so that you can actually implement it. So I'm going to take apart some of the Sermon on the Mount. But I'm going to talk about the end of Matthew 6 and most of Matthew 7. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? And the kicker is this. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Because the, there's a very interesting idea here. It's, it's certainly one of the most profound ideas that I've ever encountered. And the idea is this, is that if you configure your life so that what you are genuinely doing is aiming at the highest possible good, then the things that you need to, to survive and to thrive on a day-to-day -day basis will deliver themselves to you. If you dare to do the most difficult thing that you can conceptualize, your life will work out better than it will if you do anything else. And so the idea is, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. It's like, that's actually a fairly important caution when you're talking about not having to pay attention to what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear. It's like, what it's essentially saying is that those problems are trivial in comparison. And the probability is that if you manifest yourself properly in the world, that those things will come your way. There is no more effective way of operating in the world than to conceptualize the highest good that you can and then strive to attain it. There's no more practical pathway to the kind of success that you could have if you actually knew what success was. That's what this sermon is attempting to posit. It's like... Therefore, take no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. If you orient yourself properly, and then pay attention to what you do every day, that works. The world shifts itself around your aim. You have to have an aim in order to do something. And so, you have an aim. Well, let's say your aim is the highest possible aim. So you organize yourself around that aim, and then what happens is, the day manifests itself as a set of challenges and problems, and if you solve them properly, then you stay on the pathway towards that aim. You can point into the distance, the far distance, and you can live in the day. If everything that you're doing every day is related to the highest possible aim that you can conceptualize, well, that's the very definition of the meaning that would sustain you in your life. Back to Noah, well, all hell's about to break loose and chaos is coming. It's like when that's happening in your life, you might want to be doing something that you regard as truly worthwhile because that's what will keep you afloat when, when everything is flooded. And you don't want to wait until the flood comes to start doing that because if your ark's half built and you don't know how to captain it, the probability is very high that, that you'll drown. Take therefore no thought for the moral, but for the moral shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. It's a description of the structure of reality. That's not the same as advice. And it basically says that you'll be held accountable by the rules of the game that you choose to play. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how will you say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote of, out of thine eye and Behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Well, you might be wondering what a beam is. And a moat is a dust speck. And a beam is a very large piece of lumber. And so the issue is, 
not so much the blindness of others. You should be concerned about what's interfering with your own vision first. And you should leave other people the hell alone in relationship to that. If you would just act better, things would improve. Or if you identify the evil and the catastrophe as something that's outside, that someone else needs to fix, then you're not going to fix that. And you're going to remain blind to the things that you're doing and not doing that make things not go well. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam of thy, out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote of thy brother's eye. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. That sounded pretty optimistic. Again, I think it's a description of the structure of existential reality. And, but one of the main reasons that people don't get what they want is because they don't actually figure out what it is. Why don't you? Well, because you don't try. You don't think, okay, here's what I would like if I could have it. But you have to figure out what it is. And then you have to aim at it. If they figure out what it is that would be good for them, and then they aim at it, then they get it. People fail is because they don't ever set up the criteria for success. And so there's a proposition here, and the proposition is, if you actually want something, you can have it. Now, the question then would be, well, what do you mean by actually want? And the answer is that you reorient your life in every possible way to make the probability that that will occur as certain as possible. And that's a sacrificial idea. Or what man is there of you whom, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If ye, then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Well, this is a question about the fundamental nature of being. And one of the hypotheses in the New Testament, faith makes being good. It's a very interesting proposition. And so the notion would be, you act out the proposition that if you act properly in the world, that being will reveal itself to you as benevolent. But you will not know. You'll never know unless you do it. To assume the contrary would be to be as cynical and bitter as possible. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do you even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Conceptualize how things could be great if they were great for you, if you were taking care of yourself. And then work to make that the case for everyone else. Enter ye in at the narrow gate, because that's what straight means. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Everyone in their right mind knows that there's a million ways of doing things wrong, and one way, if you're lucky, to do things right. And so the notion that it's a, a very, very narrow pathway that you tread upon if you're doing things right, that's, that's wisdom. That's the line between chaos and order that you're supposed to be on constantly, right? It's a very, very thin line, because, and both of those aren't good. It has to, the balance has to be exactly right. I truly believe you can feel that, and I think it's your deepest instinct. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns, or figs of thistles? Even so. Every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. People who are thinking about their relationship with divinity or their relationship with God, they think, why can't a miracle just manifest itself? And I would be convinced. And, but there are negative miracles that are happening all the time. We don't pay any attention to that because what happened in the 20th century was as bitter a set of lessons as you could possibly imagine. And it's associated precisely with this. A corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Well, that's a flood motif right there. It's that if you're mostly dead wood, you're going to burn up. Think about that as a form of hell. It's a perfectly reasonable way of thinking about it. Wherefore, by their fruits shall ye know them. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. One of the proper critiques of traditional Christianity, Christianity had degenerated in its moral mission. I'm being harsh in my judgment. The idea was that if you just professed faith that that had already occurred, then you were granted eternal salvation. It's like, 
well, it's not so straightforward. And I think that that's what this line actually represents. It says, well, how do you enter into the kingdom of heaven? And the answer is quite straightforward, is that you do what Noah did to make him immune from the flood. And that's to walk with God. And that's what this sermon is about. It's laying out the practical elements of that. And the practical elements are aim at the highest possible good and play that out in the world. And then you may have the opportunity to inhabit the highest possible good that you're positing into existence. I mean, if you build a house, then maybe you can live in it. If you don't build a house, you're not going to be able to live in it. If you build a good house, then you'll be able to live in a good house. And if you build a perfect house, then maybe you can live in a perfect house. But if you just say that the house has already been built for you, and that you can just say that the house has been built for you, well then, the probability that you're going to be able to live where you need to live is, there's no probability that you're going to be able to live where you need to live. Many will say to me in that day, that's the judgment day, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. That's an archetypal idea. And partly it's archetypal because every day is judgment day. The part of you that's equivalent to the logo, say, the part of you that's your own ideal, sits in eternal judgment on your iniquity. That's the source of guilt and shame and, and, and withdrawal and then resentment and then murderousness and then genocide. There's no difference between an ideal and a judge. And so you're eternally judged by your own ideal. If you have no ideal, well then you've got no direction and no meaning in your life. And then of course, the more extreme the ideal, the harsher the judge. Christ, who's the ideal, who's above the pyramid, right? The transcendent ideal is nothing but a judge and everyone fails. You can say, well, I don't want to be judged and so I'll dispense with the ideal. But then you're Cain because Cain is exactly the person who dispenses with the ideal. There's no escaping from eternal judgment. Therefore, whoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the winds blew, and the floods came, and beat upon the house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings that people were astonished at his doctrine for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Listening to something that has substance and listening to something that is spoken because it sounds like it should sound good. And it certainly seems to me that the lines that we just reviewed have the awesome impact of authority 